a production of WGBH, Boston. of the noise, the traffic, and the construction of what is the biggest public works project ever undertaken in the United States, the Big Dig. After nine years of concrete barriers and reconfigured roads, the question is, are we any closer to the end? And the short answer is yes. To give you the latest dirt on the dig, we took our cameras under the red line to the new I-93 tunnel and we went to the top of Boston's soon to be new landmark, the Cable Stayed Bridge. And we looked at a new highway tunnel that's actually being pushed through frozen dirt. Tonight on Greater Boston, it's a big dig status report. every day rain snow cold you know just work around the clock just work somewhere on the project seven days a week 24 hours a day about 4,000 men and women have already put in over 15 million work hours on the central artery tunnel project constructing more than eight miles of tunnels along with highways bridges viaducts and other surface roads in total the state has put out more contracts than tony soprano over 118 separate multi-million dollar construction deals. Michael Lewis is the acting project director. This is a huge undertaking and, and it's really, this is our, a test case for many other cities both here in America, the rest of North America and around the world. That makes Bostonians the lab rats, moving through the maze of a public works experiment that many compare to some of the great projects of the 20th century, from the Panama Canal to the Hoover Dam although neither of those projects spawned an SEC probe or massive cost overages. But the Big Dig isn't just the biggest public works project ever undertaken in this country. It's also one of the most challenging, and not just from a cost overrun standpoint. From a technical perspective, the most, perhaps the most difficult part of the project is the fact that, first of all, it's, so much of it is underground. Um, over half of the full alignment of the roads that we're building are in tunnel. To complicate things even further, engineers promised to keep Boston open for business during the entire 15 years of construction. So roads had to be reconfigured instead of closed, and subways and trains had to be kept running. Every day, there's about 45,000 people who come in and out of this station on the MBTA commuter rail. So one of the requirements for the project here is that we could not disrupt train service during the course of the work. These train tracks crisscrossing the Fort Point Channel area are directly in the path of the new I-90 tunnels that will connect the Mass Pike with the Ted Williams Tunnel. All aboard! Conventional tunneling techniques would have shut down the trains, stranding commuters. And there was one other problem. See this dirt? It's actually landfill. The soils here uh, consist of a whole bunch of fill material that's been placed here over the past two centuries. If you were to go and excavate a tunnel opening for one of these big tunnel boxes, 40 feet high and 80 feet wide, in this type of ground, it would collapse. It wouldn't be stable. So big dig engineers decided on a technique called tunnel jacking. A concrete box is built below ground. Soil is dug out in front of the box. Then the box is pushed or jacked forward. But in order to jack the box, Boston's unstable soil had to be stabilized. So what our contractor has done here is to improve the ground ahead of time by freezing the entire mass. To create the giant dirtsicle, thousands of steel pipes are inserted into the ground and brine is pumped through them. The result, a block of soil is frozen solid. 
Once the ground is frozen, a huge hole is excavated and the two-story concrete tunnel box is built inside. We're now in the I-90 eastbound tunnel. This is the tunnel that's being jacked right now, the one that's underway. So what you have is a big concrete box that forms the tunnel structure. It's open on the front end. And we have excavation equipment on two levels here. There are loaders, grade all machines, even a robotic jackhammer unit. But the bulk of the work is done by these giant road headers. The road headers' carbide teeth slice through the frozen earth, digging out the tunnel in front of the box. This particular area of the project is just 12 feet below ground, but it's a universe all its own. I brought a couple of people down here, and from upstairs, you really have no idea what's going on down here, especially with the jacks. This is the biggest jack box that they've ever done in the world. So what's it like to work on a machine like this? 10 hours a day, six days a week. Why don't you hop up on it for a while and we'll see what you think. No thanks. As with much of the big dig, the solution to one problem can create a whole new set of difficulties. The brine-filled pipes that freeze the ground become an obstacle course once the digging starts. Since the road header can't cut through this steel, a special torch called a thermal lance must be brought in. It heats up to a cool 5,000 degrees and slices the pipe in two. Of course, all this digging creates a mountain of dirt that has to be carted away quickly. Remember, the ground is frozen, and if the dirt is left lying around, it will thaw, creating a hazard for the workmen. So this scoop tram shuttles back and forth across the floor all day long, scooping up the dirt and carting it away. After the road headers have dug out enough space in front of the box, about three feet, it's ready to be jacked forward. That might sound easy enough before you consider that this particular box is 170 feet long, about 80 feet wide, and weighs 23,000 tons. There's about 25 jacks at the rear here. Each one of these jacks has a working capacity of 535 tons. The contractor has to put this tunnel into its final position within six inches horizontally and vertically to the design alignment. The first tunnel that we did was completed back in mid-December, and they actually got that one in within three inches of the design position. By the end, this box will have traveled close to 260 feet through frozen soil and will eventually come to rest on the other side of these train tracks. But that's still a few months away. While progress here is measured foot by foot, survey crews measure the project in inches. 0.9237. As trains creep by, surveyors measure the tracks, checking for any movement. If a track shifts more than a few inches, the trains will be shut down. So far, that hasn't happened. In all, there will be three jacked tunnels. Two will form the I-90 east and westbound lanes connecting traffic with Logan Airport. A third will actually connect I-90 with I-93. And so far, at least, this project is on time. The tunnel jacking is supposed to be complete by October, and the new I-90 airport tunnel connectors should be open for traffic in 2001. backed up the tunnels. It really has a clear since this morning snarl. No accidents, just too many people trying to squeeze through the center of downtown Boston. It's bad. It's always been bad. Probably always will stay bad. It's too stressful. Ridiculous. Stop and go. Stop and go. Sometimes don't even go. Terrible. Horrible. We can't air most of the comments we got about traffic on the central artery, but I can sum it up in one eight-letter word. Gridlock. The artery was actually built for about 75,000 cars a day, but Right now, about 200,000 are crossing over it every day. The American Automobile Association says this is one of the 10 worst roads in America, and that's due in large part because the accident rate is about four times the national average. 
By 2010, predictions were gridlock on this snaggletooth highway could have reached 16 hours a day, seven days a week. The elevated artery was built in the late 50s. It wasn't designed to handle all the interstate traffic um, that, it, that has been carrying for the last 30 years. In addition to that, it's 30, 40 years old. It is um, deteriorating. It was going to need substantial reconstruction. Believe it or not, back in 1951, the elevated central artery was viewed as a sci-fi highway in the sky, a bit of the Jetsons before their time. But when the project finally got the green light and construction began, it devastated the city. The roadway leveled neighborhoods and homes in its path and split Boston's commercial district from the historic waterfront and north end. The Big Dig is designed to fix all this. This is a great opportunity. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to eliminate that elevated artery, um, to restore 27 acres of land that was taken in the 1950s, um, portions of neighborhoods that were wiped out, and it gives the city and the state an opportunity to rebuild that for the 21st century. In order to do that, a new network of roads is being built underground. In fact, while most people are completely unaware of it, the new I-93 tunnels are being built right beneath our feet. We're 100 feet down right now, roughly. The total depth in this area is 120 for a maximum depth elevation on the artery. We're standing right underneath the Red Line Station, which runs east to west, crossing Central Lottery northbound, or I-93. So we're at the very bottom right now. This is the deepest part of the big dig. The I-93 northbound tunnel is supposed to run under Dewey Square and continue north up Atlantic Avenue. There's just one, you guessed it, problem. The Red Line subway stands right in the tunnel's path. There was no room to go over it, and the engineers had promised not to disrupt train service. So there was only one choice left, tunnel under the red line. The subway runs actually east to west, but we're going northbound. So as a result of that, we had to perform this special foundation operation underground so that we didn't disrupt the uh, train traffic and uh, to fully support the station. Enter another concrete box. With this one, the top of the box acts as a new roof for the tunnel and at the same time provides support for the subway line so it doesn't cave in. The massive concrete walls of the box act as supports or underpinnings for the red line subway and the entire structure will become the new highway. Workers can occasionally hear their red line rumbling overhead but commuters are oblivious to the construction going on right beneath their feet. When people come in and they see for themselves, then they realize that on top, you just have an illusion, but down below is the real action. You know, I don't think a lot of people really know what's going on down here. You hear so much bad publicity about the papers, and uh, there's a lot of guys down here that come down here day in, day out, and get the job done. It's hard to see how much work is going on here because there's nothing to show for it. You know, they see us go to work and come out. That's all they see. But there's actually quite a bit to show for it by now. At the entrance to the I-93 tunnels, you can see the tiles going up. A few steps further down, the merge between I-90 and I-93 is clearly visible. Keep walking through the I-93 tunnel and you'll see the reinforced concrete walls that will become the new highway tunnel and the giant struts that act as supports to prevent the walls from caving in while tunneling continues. Just five blocks away, there's a dramatically different story unfolding. After I-93 passes under the red line, the underground road continues up Atlantic Avenue and within a matter of feet runs into the blue line. The engineering problem isn't figuring out how to tunnel under the blue line, but coming up with a way to tunnel over it. Right now, I'm standing about 40 feet below State Street. This is actually the shallowest part of the Big Dig because we are standing on top of the blue line. As we were walking down here, we could see the trains going by. This right here is going to be I-93. North is that way. Five lanes of traffic will head north towards the Callahan Tunnel. When it's finished, the roof of the highway tunnel will pass just 36 inches below ground level and the roadway will sit just a few feet above the roof of the Blue Line Tunnel. We're building a new roadway, which will be the tunnel roof and the roadway at the same time. So it'll, it'll be like a bridge across the Blue Line, and in 
inside the blue line is going to be completely remodeled. Trying to build a new highway without bringing the city to a screeching halt continues to be one of the toughest challenges of the big dig. That's really one of the, one of the things that's uh, unique about this project, where we're located. I mean, this type of work is done all over, but uh, not downtown in a downtown major city, a major city as old as Boston with a lot of unknowns underground. Take a look from under the elevated artery. More than 200,000 cars pass overhead every day. And it's crucial those six lanes of traffic remain open, even as new tunnels are being built right underneath. And there's not much room to maneuver either, so it's impossible to use traditional excavation equipment. Engineers had to find a way to build tunnels in the confined space of downtown Boston. The solution, a liquid compound called slurry, which serves as temporary fills in the walls. Here's how it works. First, a giant milling machine digs a rectangular trench. As the earth is removed, slurry is pumped into the hole to prevent the walls from collapsing. Huge steel I-beams are then lowered into the hole. Finally, concrete is poured and the slurry is pumped out and reused. How, how deep are we now? 93 feet now. We're going about 106. This 100-ton giant is just one of the slurry machines grinding away all over the big dig. The teeth on this milling machine are even larger than jaws and can pulverize virtually anything in their path. Without slurry walls, the big dig tunnels would have folded like patio furniture. In all, more than five miles of slurry walls will have been built by the project's end. And right now, they're about 90% complete. 450 panels so far. We, we got about 40 left. About Kenny Gerbic has been working with this milling machine for three years now. This is incredible. You know, uh, you're outside all day. You're in, you're in the beautiful weather. You know, uh, you, you, you're building America. Back under the expressway, another project is almost complete one of the most delicate on the big dig. As the new walls of the I-93 tunnel were being built, engineers had to begin the slow and hazardous process of transferring the weight of the existing artery from the old support structures to the new ones, almost like putting the road on crutches. Obviously, in order to excavate below uh, the I-93 uh, artery, we had to resupport it and repost it. It's a process called underpinning. Engineers have replaced the old green columns that held up the elevated artery with new supports, these rust-colored ones that now rest on the slurry walls. We're standing beneath the uh, I-93 uh, elevated artery, and we're standing right next to one of the underpinning columns that frames that we installed and one of the underpinning columns that we just cut. Most of the old green columns have been cut away leaving the elevated artery almost entirely resting on the new supports. But drivers crawling along the expressway shouldn't worry. In fact, we've been monitoring the structure, and the structure is staying where it's supposed to be, which is where it always was. And where it will remain for now. While most of the engineering feats of the big dig are taking place underground and out of sight, there's one project that's quietly taking shape in front of our very eyes. Once northbound commuters make their way through all these tunnels, they're going to come across the Cable Stayed Bridge. This is the widest Cable Stayed Bridge in the world and the only one with an asymmetrical design, if you like that kind of thing. Now, the project designers say they hope this will become the focal point of the project, and city planners say they actually think it might become a new landmark for Boston. Get your second wind yet? Yeah. It's the one that'll be on the postcards and all that kind of stuff, you know. And Boston, I think, will become known by this bridge, the same as, you know, San Francisco is known by the Golden Gate and Paris by the Eiffel Tower. Those are some pretty big aspirations. On the other hand, it's going to be a pretty impressive bridge. I'm standing 250 feet above ground on the south tower of the Cable Stayed Bridge. It was an agonizing 400 steps to get here, but I have to tell you, it was well worth it. I'm looking at the Fleet Center right in front of me. Off to my north is Logan Airport. 
And to my left here and in back of me is Charlestown. It's just a spectacular view of the city and frankly, of the big dig. The bridge will carry 10 lanes of traffic between its two Y-shaped towers, including two cantilevered lanes suspended on the east side. Between the north and south towers, rows of cables will help support the 1,400 foot long bridge. The towers will be capped off with pyramids designed to reflect the nearby Bunker Hill Monument. So how much longer will it be before this expanse is we'll finished? We'll be out to the, the middle of the river about the end of June, and then we go around to the north side and come, come that way to join in the middle about the end of this year, early 2001. And we hope to meet in the middle. No doubt drivers do too. The bridge is resting on concrete stilts, which have been drilled down to the bedrock. About 180 concrete slabs make up the floor of the bridge. Each slab is 20 feet wide, 40 feet long, and weighs about 100,000 pounds. The slabs must be barged in and lifted into place with the powerful ringer crane. But the feature that's got everybody talking are these enormous white cable stays. There will eventually be 116 of these heavy plastic tubes affixed to the bridge. The cables themselves, uh, inside the coating you see is just a white pipe. And inside there is actual cables that support the bridge. And each pipe has a different number of cables in it, depending on where it is on the bridge. There could be anywhere from 20 to 60 individual steel cables inside these white pipes. Because they're long and unwieldy, they must be carefully lifted into place with a little help from this tower crane. This one here makes the boom, that, which is above us, go up and down. And these levers over here are for the hoist to make the cables go up and down. We swing with our feet, so we always have, you know, with very, uh, you know, coordination is a big part of this job. Using a series of voice commands, the ground workers communicate with crane operator Pete Bernazzi, who sits on his perch more than 200 feet in the air. All by radio, and then once we get top, once we get up on the tower, a lot of times it's done with hand signals, but mostly done with radio. There's a lot of trust in this business, and you have to put a lot of trust to your people out on the bottom. You know, they they have to be my eyes. Back on the bridge, the crew watches the giant cable stay swing back and forth as they provide Bernazzi with instructions. Point that a little bit. Download. Download. Load it up. I'm gonna crank it in, all right? Finally, they grab the wire and prepare to pull the cable stay into place. It's going to be the showpiece of Boston. Anyone that comes in and out of Boston is going to cross this bridge. In 20, 30 years from now, one of my kids and all my grandkids, I can say I had part of, part of building that project. But let's face it, there's one more thing to this job we haven't talked about, and that's the view. We watch the traffic, and uh, we watch the planes land at Logan Airport, and uh, a lot of times we give out traffic reports. Of course, if the cab of a tower crane isn't quite high enough for you, talk to Chris Domenico. He spends some of his time up in this crow's nest. Get a clear shot of the state house at the top. Plenty of nice tower cranes, brand new buildings. Almost got a shot of Fenway Park. The cable stayed bridge is due to open for traffic in 2002. Day after day, the crane operators, iron workers, and laborers go about their business at a cost of about $5 million a day. Meanwhile, as the project enters its final stages, people are starting to look past the work itself to the end result. What do you hope the legacy will be here? Well, you know, when you, when you drive through here with your grandchildren later on in life, you know, you can tell them, Grandpa was part of this. It's a temple to the car, you know? 
when this civilization's gone, they're going to be saying, hey, what the what, you know, what was this? You know, just like the pyramids. I think people will be proud of it when it's done. And I think uh, 20 years from now, they won't be able to envision the city uh, with a interstate highway running through it visibly. I think it'll be very hard to visualize what life was like before the 27 acres of, you know, of open space was in the downtown. They won't be able to remember what it meant to get to the airport by having to drive north on the artery, go through the Callahan Tunnel to get to the airport, and how long they spent stuck in the Callahan Tunnel. Um, so I think for all of those reasons, um, when people look back on it, they'll say, of course it should have been done. Maybe, then again, maybe not because all this technological wizardry has come at a price. Sticker shock has plagued the big dig throughout the project as the cost has risen from 2.5 to $13.6 billion. According to state officials, that price tag includes 2.8 billion in cost overruns. The cost, along with a timetable that has stretched like taffy, has made the big dig an ongoing political issue from Beacon Hill to Capitol Hill. But in all likelihood, the controversy will disappear right around the time the traffic jams do. That's it for our Greater Boston special presentation on the Big Dig. I'm Emily Rooney. Good night.